全員がテロをやるなどで言ってるわけでは全くないんですが、10万人に1人とか100万人に1人の人が、えー、神の命令による義務だと考えて、えー、テロを行えば、結果的にジェハードは行われ、現象としては行われ、えー、続いていきます。えーこ、これを利用しているというところが、対処する際には難しくなる。しかも、えー、非常に、えーまあ、ブラックジョークと、まあ、ジョークと言ってはいけないんですがつまり事故がないと、まあ、責任を取れないと言いましたが究極の形、えー、事故を消滅させる究極の形は自爆テロですね自爆テロをしてしまった犯人の罪を、ね、犯人に罪を償わせることはあできないんですねそして自爆テロを強査する人も直接、えー命令してるのではなくほのめかすことによって結果的に誰かに不特定多数のうち誰かにジハードを行わせているそれによって、えー、強査した人間の罪を責任を問いにくいということです、えーまあ、これらの、まあ、要素があるがゆえにですね、えー、ジハードグローバルジハードに対して法的な責任を取らせることは極めてますそして最後にあ今起こって、えー、これはあの対処策を取るための実際的な問題ですけれどもあのこのジハードには2つの、えー、モードがあると言いましたが、えー、その1つの特に今問題になっているモードは2番目のモードであってそれは領域支配をしてしまっているイラクやシリアやリビアで領域支配をしてしまっているこれが問題ですところが、えー、今お話ししたようにこの領域支配をなくすために、えー、ある程度軍事行動はおそらく有効ですただそれによって領域支配が狭まれば、まあ、私の理論が正しいのであれば必然的にもう一つのモードである拡散の方向に向かっていくその結果として少なくとも短期的にはテロの減少テロの事件は増えるだろうということです最後にもうこのような見方かな観点から将来展望をちょっとだけしたいと思います。で、えー、イスラム国に対する軍事行動は今強まっています。ですから、モードの2つ目の領域支配は狭まっていくことは確かだと思います。それによって予測できることは、イスラム国の組織がまたバラバラになって、世界に散っていく。それによって結果的に世界のあちこちにイスラム国を名乗る勢力あるいはイスラム国を名乗る個人が分散していくことになるそれはイスラム国が弱まっていくあるいはイスラム国が、まあ、変質していくということでもあります、えー、ただあそうなった時にイスラム国はおそらく数年後のイスラム国はもしかするとイスラム国と、まあ、グローバルジハードではありますけれどもジハードであるよりも、まあ、グローバリズムあるいはアンチグローバリズムですね、えー、つまり一般的な意味での反システム運動に変容していくんではないかと思いますね、えー、そこで日本では極めてよく聞かれる質問ですがあ日本人の、えー、イスラム国の人は出てくるんですかと聞かれます、えー、私は、まあ、イエスノーで答えるんですがもちろん今のメカニズムとえー、日本人でもイスラム国を名乗ることはできますで名乗って事件を起こすことも可能です、えー、ただしそれが世界のイスラム国のを名乗る人たちの中で認められるかあつまり、えー、自らをイスラム国であると認識させる、えー、それだけの能力を持っている人が日本にどれだけいるかと考えると、えー、あ残念ながらと言ってはいけないんですがあまりたくさんはいないと。えー、そういう意味でそれほど私は心配していませんしかし全ての社会ではあ反システム的アンチシステム的な運動をしたい人というのはいると思いますですのでそういう人たちが何か事件を起こしてかつ、えー、今有効であるという理由でイスラム国を名乗ることもあるのではないか、まあ、それがあ今後の方向性であり、えー、日本で起こりうることだと思いますそそしてそのような反システム運動へと変わっていくイスラム国はより、えー、分かりにくいものになる理解しがたい、えー、事件の連なれになっていくんではないかと思います
。しかし、ね、この時、我々は根本的なテロリズムの、えーまあ、定義に立ち返らないといけないんですね。テロリズムというのは、単なる犯罪はテロリズムではないんですね。それは、その社会において、えー、テロだと認められ、えー、認識された、認知されることによって、えー、テロになる、えー。そういう意味で、イスラム国という理念は、あその世界中で自らの単なる暴力集団ではなく正当なテロリストとして認めさせるための今現在最も有効なスローガンでありシンボルであるということですそういう意味で今後イスラム国は再び理念としてそして反グローバリズムの理念としてあるいは反システム的な理念として今後まあ、拡散していくことになるんじゃないかと思います。えーまあ、以上です。
During the post-war period, there have been numerous cases of food safety incidents. Probably one of the earlier and most prominent ones was the case of Minamata disease, when people ate uh, seafood that was contaminated with mercury. But as the economy grew more affluent, Japanese consumers began demanding greater assurances of safety. But in spite of that, during the 1990s and 2000s, there were a series of cases that brought, uh, called into question the safety of the food supply. So for example, there were occasional outbreaks of E. coli, uh, pesticides uh, were being used that were not supposed to be used. Uh, some Japanese companies were found to be taking chicken and eel that was produced abroad and labeling it as if it was domestic. In 2000, uh, the Morinaga Bell Company uh, made a bunch of people sick. And, uh, Japan also had to deal with an outbreak of PSC. And perhaps one of the most prominent of these cases was in 2008 when uh, a family in Chiba Prefecture and later on a lot more people fell sick after eating uh, pot dumplings or gyoza that were contaminated with a pesticide in, the, uh, in China. And further testing revealed that actually the, the, uh, the contamination was done by a worker who probably had no idea that these uh, that gyoza were meant to be sent to Japan, and he was just angry at the company and the labor standards. But this set off a whole international diplomatic incident. And uh, on the Japanese side, the media covered this story extensively, and there were headlines such as the terrorist gyoza dumplings are coming to attack Japan. There were magazines that came out with guides on how you can avoid uh, Chinese-grown products. Uh, some supermarket retailers vowed to pull out all Chinese-made products uh, from their shelves. But a lot of these impulses only serve to highlight the extent to which Japan relies on food imports to feed itself. So it turns out it's really difficult in Japan not to eat foreign products. Uh, Japan uh, currently relies on approximately 60% um, 60 of its calories come from imports uh, in, um, to, to feed itself. And this is a figure that's been, the, the Ministry of Agriculture for years has been saying that they want to really raise the self-sufficiency ratio, but it hasn't really moved that much in the last 10 to 15 years. And one of the outcomes of a lot of these food safety incidents was that there, there was, uh, by the public at large, greater trust in the safety and quality of domestic products over their imported counterparts. So even though a lot of the, these food safety incidents were actually caused domestically by Japanese companies, uh, in numerous surveys, it was shown that given a choice, Japanese consumers would prefer to eat domestic over imported, even if it actually meant to meant paying a little bit extra. Uh, and this has been corroborated by a number of other researchers. For example, um, in a study of Tsukiji by anthropologist Ted Bester, he found that um, Tsukiji traders had a preference for domestic fish over imported, even if they were of similar quality and shape. Um, so now I want to turn into a couple of ethnographic cases to illustrate my argument about the national. And on a cold winter morning, this was in 2010, I met with Masaomi, who's a Japanese business executive who was residing at the time in Chile. And he worked for Nippon Meat Packers Chile. This is a company in Japan, it's called Nippon Hamu. It's a major uh, meat uh, trading company. And uh, this company had suffered from a major scandal in the early 2000s. During the BSC incident, uh, Japanese uh, meat packers was found to have been passing off uh, imported beef as it was national, and then cashing in on a buyback program that the Japanese government had to dispose of infected cattle. So this incident caused a whole shakeup of their corporate, um, um, their corporate uh, organization. Uh, some supermarkets recalled uh, Nippon Hamu products from their shelves, and the company lost basically a lot of its reputation, and they changed a lot of their personnel. And among their pledges to restore trust in consumers, they said that they would implement a really strict traceability program. And in their 2008 annual report, the president of the company talked, wrote at length about uh, the role that his company could play in ensuring that Japanese consumers could have access to safe and high quality food. And he acknowledged that, yes, Japanese consumers really want to eat domestic because that's what, where they think safety is, and my company can produce this. And here I was in Chile, um, talking to a business executive who was exporting tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of corn from Japan to Chile. So I saw this as a contradiction, that on the one hand, Nippon Hamu was saying, yes, we can produce, we will give you domestically produced corn, and at the same time they have this huge import global operation. So I, I was hoping to catch this business executive in a contradiction, but he didn't even flinch at my question, and he said, 
What happens is that local production refers to 100% integrated production. What does this mean? That the pig is ours, the feed is controlled by us, it is slaughtered in one of our houses, it is processed at our plant, and it is sold through one of our distributors. And then I ask, so it means then that it's not produced in Japan. They said, well, in Japan things are different, with different processing plants, with lots of small producers, and things go to plant, and sometimes you just don't know. Well, I mean, you know whose it is. But there isn't traceability as complete as we would like to see. And here in Chile, we can actually provide this 100% traceability that sometimes is not possible elsewhere. That is what we refer to as local production, and we haven't had any problems. So in that, in that moment, Masami articulated uh, an alternative understanding of the meaning of the local, and it is one that I encountered under different guises throughout my research. And that is that local in this context was not defined by territory, but by control of the supply chain to Japanese standards. This understanding of local doesn't mean that the, the port was Chilean and that it became Japanese, but that the port kept being producer it was conceived of as always already being Japanese. It was a Japanese breed, it was a Japan, designed to Japanese standards, and imported by a Japanese company here. And to be sure, there is still an important bottleneck at customs where products are still clearly defined as either domestic or foreign. And the pork when sold in Japan is labeled as foreign. But at least symbolically and in spirit, the argument was that the, the production of pork abroad wasn't necessarily all that different from what could be done within the territory of Japan. There was a second component there, which I turned now to, which is about inspectors. So as part of this research, as um, Professor Takeuchi also mentioned, I was looking at salmon. And Chile uh, has become one of the world's largest producers of salmon, and Japan is one of its most important uh, markets. Likewise, in Japan, uh, in the 1960s, almost salmon was not a very popular seafood item in Japan, but by the 2000s, it had become the most consumed seafood uh, in Japan. And with few exceptions, most operations in Chile are either locally owned or they're uh, joint companies between Chilean and Europeans. And as I, I visited a number of these plants, and one of the things that caught my attention was that almost all of these plants had Japanese inspectors on site. And uh, sometimes this person was a full-time fixture in their facilities, and sometimes these people came and uh, went, especially during harvest season for salmon. As I heard more and more stories about these inspectors, I wondered if other trading partners employed different um, similar strategies. And one of the executives told me, the Americans, the Europeans, they care whether your paper side order or that the fish arrives. Maybe they come once, but nothing like the Japanese. And uh, this is also something that I didn't only find in summer, but other researchers have found in terms of other commodities, the presence of these inspectors. And Chilean executives entertain a whole set of theories about why Japanese trading companies were sending them these inspectors. Some of them had some practical theories such as, well, they eat the fish raw as sashimi, so they are really concerned about food safety. Others were like, well, they have really great um, eating practices, and some were just more dismissive. They were like, when I pressed the point, they would say, well, they're Japanese, and that's why, and they would just uh, um, but it, it became very clear as the research went on that regardless of, um, of the reason, uh, fish for the Japanese market had to be produced differently from fish to other places. Whether it was the species of salmon, the fat content, the color of the flesh. In fact, if you fish that is sent to Japan, salmon is colored in a, to a different hue of orange than uh, someone that is sent to Europe or North America. A lot of things conspired into turning the product into something that was recognizable within Japan. So as I heard more stories of these Japanese inspectors, um, and I, I didn't go to a single plant that didn't have this experience, I began to see these inspections as, as part of a set of practices that extend the aura of Japanese domestic production over the supply, ch over the supply chain. And it accomplishes something similar to what Masaomi explained in regards to Nippon meat packers, that by enforcing Japanese standards throughout the production process, symbolically the product is brought a little bit more into the sphere of the domestic in Japan. And in fact, Masaomi, uh, Nippon meat packers, he also had inspectors at his plants. Now, I want to switch uh, tax and come back to the domestic. Now, as we heard uh, throughout uh, today and yesterday, on March 11, 2011, Japan was hit by the great uh, East Japan earthquake and the subsequent uh, meltdowns of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. 
But the Japanese government instituted uh, safety, emergency safety standards six days after that, on March 17, 2011. And ever since, the Japanese government has insisted that given its uh, safety levels and what they, the data they have there available, that no significant health effects should result from their explosions. At the same time, there are numerous uh, opinions on the effects of low-level exposure to radiation, and there were certain sectors of the Japanese population that did not feel confident that they could completely trust the government on whether these standards were safe or not. So I conducted fieldwork in Japan from 2011 to 2013, and one of the things I found was that uh, many people were just developmental zones of places of safety and of danger. So several mothers of young children met avoided products grown in northeastern Japan, and even within Fukushima Prefecture, you could find stores that uh, stopped exclusively vegetables grown in Kansai you know, or for the south. <coughs> so in the aftermath of Fukushima, you would have seen that one logical alternative for people who were concerned would have been to buy products that were imported. Uh, and to an extent, uh, some uh, Australian beef sales, for example, were reported to be quite strong. But for people who were concerned about food safety, they, had, uh, they actually really believed in the merits of localism and local consumption. So many consumers had to decide whether they would continue purchasing food from affected regions, or if they could revisit their ideas about the distinction between the domestic and the foreign. So for example, in November of 2011, I attended a study group about food safety and radiation, and towards the end, the speaker said, well, you, he, she acknowledged this fear, said, you know, we've all been there, you've all thought that, well, wouldn't it be so much easier if I just buy imported products and forget about this radiation question completely? And then she said, but she followed that with saying, but you all know where that would lead us. And she left it unsaid, but the implicit message was that just because there was radiation in Japan now, did not supersede a lot of the concerns about imported products, such as the use of pesticides, or post, uh, pre and post harvest, or additives, or GMOs, and all of that. So it was a really difficult dilemma if you wanted to be uh, supportive of local farmers, but also wanted to ensure safety. For those I met uh, who are committed to food localism, the Fukushima Micro Disaster Challenge, but did not embrace previous conceptions of the national and foreign. Rather, it asked for creativity and how to address the circumstances. So for some, this became eating food that was only sourced from Western Japan, and there were, for example, retailers such as Daichi and Morikai that had vegetable sets that were only uh, from Western Japan. Uh, it meant that for others, they were really careful about the screening of the products, and a few I met actually admitted to buying more imported, but would do so only privately. A different effect that I found on the, except, on the effect of, of the concept of Kokusan after the Fukushima nuclear disaster was a little bit of fear about the ability of Kokusan to provide an abstraction from the local level. So for example, if you go to a grocery store in Japan, you will find that most produce is labeled by prefecture of origin, so the, uh, the cucumber will say whether it's from Saitama prefecture or from um, uh, some other prefecture. Um, at the same time, some products are labeled as Kokusan without much further reference about the specific prefecture where it came from. And one of the concerns I found about uh, within consumers was that the label Kokusan could be used as an abstraction by blending Fukushima rice with rice from other prefectures and thereby making it Kokusan and not having to say that the rice was grown in Fukushima and therefore avoid some of the consumer fears about it. Now, the rice from Fukushima has, uh, like, has is been thoroughly tested, and it's um, almost none of it nowadays shows levels that exceed the government safety standards. But during my fieldwork, this was one of the fears I encountered that the mixing of things across prefectures and the abstraction could provide a way out from signaling localism within the food uh, supply. <coughs> So the construction of, of the national is a contingent process with multiple players vying towards certain versions of space and territory. So in the case of food in Japan, the division between the foreign and the domestic has always been a salient feature of analysis. But in today's paper, what I want to do is, that, is to show that the national is a slightly malleable category when it comes to food provenance. That space refers both to physical and symbolic locations. And that, um, the national doesn't always fall neatly and map neatly onto a physical territory, and that there are practices with which the, the, the concept of the national can be stretched 
either across global uh, chains or more or further down into local regions within Japan. And as such, it requires us uh, as well as to be attentive to the ways in which this concept can move. Thank you very much. Actually, I forgot um, introducing uh, my colleague, uh, discussant, uh, Professor Jim Holyfield. Uh, in Dallas, I think that I can assume that everybody knows him, but uh, uh, here probably not. So, uh, um, well, you can see the bio uh, about his achievements. Uh, he's a distinguished, distinguished scholar of international migration. One thing that I'm struck with uh, what he often says is uh, um, he received the uh, uh, 2016 Award of International Studies Association Award of Distinguished Scholar of International Migration. But when he wrote the dissertation about international migration, his advisor told him that immigration is not an international relations issue or security issue. And now I think it is a central, one of the central issues of security. Very much, Takayuchi Sensei. Uh, well, I think it's almost five minutes after five o'clock. <laughs> and uh, I must say, I am impressed to see this many people here late on Saturday afternoon. And here we are standing between you and your Saturday evening activities. Uh, I know we have some brilliant cocktail and things prepared some of you after this meeting is over, uh, but it just strikes me as a really sharp contrast between Japanese and American culture, or European culture for that matter, that you would see this many people you know, sitting in an active meeting at this hour uh, on Saturday afternoon, so I uh, congratulate you on still being here. Uh, and I'm not going to bore you with another lecture, I can tell you that. Uh, I'm just going to make a few comments. You brilliantly uh, synthesize all of these uh, uh, last papers. Uh, but um, I'm glad you stayed because these were incredibly interesting set of papers, comments. And I was thinking about how to uh, bring about the synthesis. And I think you can just think about this uh, in terms of new versus old. You know, I'm, not getting any younger, so I older, uh, so I have a somewhat perhaps older perspective on these issues. But it's it's intriguing to me to see the how these these three papers, these three uh, presentations, go back between uh, the new and the old. I mean, this panel was uh, labeled as new issues that I guess don't fit uh, the tradition here, and. Um, I thought I would just raise a, a few questions to see if I could uh, get you uh, thinking about how to link these uh, issues together. Uh, starting with the first issue on cyber, uh, I think everybody in here would agree uh, that cyber is new, that there's something different, you know, sexy about this. I don't think anyone would object to, to bringing cyber into a discussion about security issues. Uh, and uh, one thing that did strike me from your first presentation, uh, it looks like Japan was a little bit late to the party. Uh, so, you know, I guess better late than never. Um, you know, cyber has been a bigger issue uh, perhaps in some societies uh, than in others. Uh, and just to jump ahead a little bit, I mean, you know, certainly the Japanese have an experience with terrorism. terrorist activity that take place in Japan. Uh, but it strikes me that Japan is a little bit sheltered from some of the more recent uh, uh, problems of terrorism. Uh, I think there's there's something, again, my colleague Josh Rovner and others in the room, uh, Admiral Walsh, you know, there's something very asymmetric about this. So, I mean, clearly, you know, we're talking about asymmetric threats, asymmetric and uh, the, the emphasis that all of you, uh, I mean, the one, one thing that links all three of these things 
together is, you know, the vulnerability. You know, that there's something really threatening and makes you feel very vulnerable. I mean, you can't be sure that your food is safe to eat um, if you can't be sure that your communications are somehow secure, that your data are protected. This makes you feel vulnerable. Uh, and uh, I think Keiichi Sensei you know, brilliantly showed us how, you know, how vulnerable we are uh, to these, these new threats. <coughs> Uh, but there's also something, if I could be so bold, especially with my cultural anthropologist colleague here, uh, there's something very old about all this. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I'm getting old enough now, I've seen uh, the constant attempts to, uh, you know, let's deconstruct uh, the national, Let, let's get rid of the nation state. I mean, this thing is so, seems so antiquated. Why do we even need to be a national terms? Well, you can see again in all three of these presentations uh, how the old issues of the territory you know, come back here. I mean, it may be an imagined community, but I don't know, Japanese have a very vivid imagination. Japanese people are very, they have a very, very strong sense of community. And um, maybe it has something to do with uh, being an island nation, you know, no man uh, is an island. You heard that expression before. No, no nation is an island. Well, maybe some nations are. An island. Uh, but you know, the, the sense of territory uh, and the need to protect the territory and to protect the community, uh, whether it's food safety, you know, cybersecurity, uh, or protecting us from from jihad. Uh, you know, the, the, the nation state still has that fundamental uh, responsibility uh, to give us safety and security. And, that, and, and we know that if the state doesn't succeed in doing that, it's a failed state. <laughs> so, um, so I do think that there is something quite old uh, about this uh, idea, even though these are uh, admittedly uh, new issues uh, in security. Uh, so, in a way, we're going a little bit back to the future here, I guess, uh, in, in terms of how important it is to uh, uh, not forget uh, the imperative of the territory. And I thought Ikiuchi Sensei did this uh, brilliantly. I love the, the different modes, uh, the different dilemmas that uh, you walked us through. I assume you're, you're publishing this as a brilliant paper somewhere, or that you're already working on your 10th or 12th or 13th book, or having ever many you've written. But, um, it was, you know, the fact that, you know, you have this, this, this terrorist threat that seems so diffuse, that seems so hard to grasp, uh, and I thought you, you really did a great job of illustrating, you know, what, what a challenge this is for the traditional Western way of looking at, I Western in quotation marks here, uh, looking at politics, looking at the law. Uh, one of the things that's always fascinated me about this debate over terrorism is, you know, are these criminals, is this a criminal activity? You know, can't you boil this down to individuals who are, who are clearly committing uh, criminal acts, or is this an act of war? You know, and how do you, how do you, I mean, remind me of, you know, debates over torts and, you know, the Anglo-American legal system. I mean, how are we assigning assign blame and harm? Uh, so, in a way, this is a very old uh, question. Um, one thing I did want to stress here is um, going back to uh, an earlier discussion, an earlier panel, uh, which is uh, let's not forget uh, the public here and how the public is thinking about this uh, and what makes something uh, a threat which in, in a democracy means if the public is upset, if the public is concerned, uh, in a democracy, the government must respond somehow uh, to that feeling of threat. Uh, and, and in each of these papers, you know, you can see uh, you can see that that dynamic here. And I'm not sure if it, if it helps us explain somebody like Donald Trump, or if it helps us explain the rise of a kind of reactive populism. Uh, but clearly,
really we're in an era here where there is a general feeling, a sentiment of unease, of vulnerability, fear, uh, feeling of threat, uh, and uh, the public concern over this, uh, whether it's uh, you know the, the, the safety of nuclear power plants and, and a nuclear disaster, uh, the safety of information, the basic privacy that uh, governments are supposed to protect our privacy, protect our liberty, uh, give us security, uh, or whether it's a concern about um, the safety of the food that we eat. Um, uh, you know, so there's, uh, you know, we do live, I think, in that sense, in an era of concern, an era of vulnerability, an era of threat. Uh, you know, it's too late in the day on Saturday for me to decide whether this is really something new. <laughs> I'm sure if we look back historically or comparatively, we would find probably similar episodes. Uh, so, you know, I think I, I should probably stop there. Uh, just, you know, I've, I've spent enough time on this new versus old uh, issue. Uh, are these really new? To what extent are they old? Um, so I just wanted to challenge each of you on that, on that score, and you certainly are free to respond. Uh, but before you do that, since it's already 5.15, and I think we were supposed to stop at this panel at 5.15, uh, are we going to take a couple of questions? Yeah, okay, so uh, you've been such a great audience, you're such a brilliant audience, and, and before I do take the questions, I just want to interject one thing here, because I'm not sure I'll get the microphone again before the day is over. Uh, but we do owe a tremendous debt of you know, to KU University, uh, to the, uh, the Global uh, Security Center here, um, and uh, the links we have with the Tower Center in Texas, all the way from Texas to I mean, that's impressive enough in itself. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to point out that the Japan Foundation, which is here, represented here, uh, a lot of this would not have been possible. Probably none of it would have been possible you know, without that kind of support uh, from uh, very enlightened foundations. Uh, and don't forget that the Sun and Star program itself was set up initially by, uh, by a gift, a grant from the Hitachi. Uh, so, uh, I did forget, we're looking at you and old, and again, each of you can think about this. Uh, we were also back to the issue of public versus private, you know, and the balance of public and private power. So, if you look at cyber, you know, Admiral Walsh is working uh, in a company here, doing some very innovative things, bringing uh, his ideas from, um, from, from the military to bear in the private sector. So, you've got, you know, how, to what extent are we looking at public-private partnerships to address the cyber issue? You know, how do you think of the public versus private the balance of power with respect to uh, dealing with terrorism? You know, we can't really fight terrorism unless the public is involved in this. And you have to say the same thing, obviously, about the issue of security. So, on that note, let me stop and see if uh, any of you are strong enough and uh, dynamic enough on Saturday afternoon to actually ask a question. So please, uh, let's take some questions, identify yourselves, and uh, keep, keep it short. <laughs> questions.
actually have some organizational competence, at which point the United States and other countries are very capable of undoing that network. Is this something that should keep us up at night, or is this just the fact that the light of the system? Okay, uh, and, the, and the other admiral here has it. He wants to get in on this. I think one of the aspects of cyber that makes it, uh, from a policy perspective, uh, so interesting right now is because the undefined roles, missions, and relationships between government and the private sector. Um, you know, at least in the other areas that we covered, everybody knows what they're supposed to do. There's uh, policy and execution implications associated with authorities that go with those particular subjects that we discussed. But in the area of cyber, particularly <coughs> when we consider it's a very low barrier to entry for an adversary. Uh, it's a very high bar for a company to be able to perform at a level where it can defend itself. When you think of, of uh, you know, the work that people do in uniform to, to go uh, away to fight a prospective adversary, uh, the adversary sits in the laptop right here. So, so how does how does government define its relationship with its citizens as well as with the private sector? Particularly when we talk about uh, uh, ideas that were, I think, rightfully proposed here when it comes to deterrence. Uh, companies are now at a point where they want to hack back because because they keep waiting for government to play a role, and and yet um, government said is just struggling with how do they insert themselves into this discussion. In the case of the Sony hack. Um, it was destructive. So, so it was, it was uh, uh, in the Ukraine, in terms of the ability to hack into a grid system and start shutting down power plants. Um, where is the government role and uh, help us understand how deterrence applies in this space? Well, I think in the interest of time, which we better give everybody a chance to respond very quickly. Unfortunately, we are reaching the end, so uh, why don't we go in reverse order? Let's have Nick, Nicholas uh, respond first, and just come up and get a microphone, and then we'll uh, go down the line. So, Nicholas, you're, you're on. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your comments on the old menu. I agree that some of these debates have been playing out for quite some time, especially in the 1990s, and also thank you Adel, for their comments on, um, on food. Uh, one thing I did notice uh, that was interesting in the, uh, to say this briefly, in terms of production for the Japanese market abroad was that um, because Japanese uh, buyers are usually willing to pay a premium, you can send the best stuff to Japan. But there's actually quite a, there's a lot of buyers down the line that can use the stuff that's not, uh, like that doesn't meet the standard, the very strict standards are available in Japan. Of course, at the domestic level, this goes in all sorts of directions. Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, in the interest of time, but we, I would love to think more about your comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, 